Good morning, Jersey City. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you to the event organizers and thank you to Mayor Fulop and the entire city for having us here. So let's get right to it as time is tight. I would like you to go with me on a journey today into the history of Jersey City railroads and the economy of the harbor. And I come to this subject because many of us in this room well know that Jersey City struggles to get respect. You don't have to organize too many brunches telling people about Skinner's Loft or tell people to move to Jersey City too many times before you realize it can be like pulling teeth. And this has historical reasons. Jersey City has long lived in New York City's shadow. So my project as a historian is to ask what was actually happening here as historians were so busy writing about the city across the Hudson River. And my fundamental question is why is it we have struggled so mightily to earn our attention, to earn our respect? And as my answer, I provide you railroads. Take a look at Jersey City's incredible history of railroads. Now you don't have to ask too many of my students to learn that I very much enjoy speaking about railroads. In fact, in class, I enjoy speaking about railroads so much that I suspect the students envision me in my apartment with toy trains like Sheldon Cooper. But as true as this may be, this does not take away from the incredible explanatory power of railroads in history, not in the least. If you look at the images, the first from 1911, this map where you see from the top of the slide the incredible railroads of what we now call Newport, or down at the southern edge of the map, the railroads of what we now call Liberty State Park. Even as you get the railroads under the river for the very first time in 1906, those red lines mark out our current path system. On the surface, railroads very much appear to be everything. On the other image, on the right of the slide, you're seeing an aerial shot of present-day Liberty State Park. Just look at them. Look at those railroads, tracks and spurs as far as the eye can see. And this is very true in the pictorial record, in the archival record. Railroads were everything. One of the great historians of New Jersey, his name is Thomas Fleming. In his book for the Bicentennial, he estimated that a full 98% of the waterfront acreage of Jersey City was directly owned and controlled by railroad companies at the turn of the 20th century. This is a major story, and I'm here to tell it to you today. This 1955 image shows you, in the divide between the pinkish color, you have actual neighborhoods, and then in the gray color, you have railroads. And this stark juxtaposition in the map gives you a sense of what I would like to present to you as my fundamental idea. My idea is this. If you study economic history, not political history, but economic history, if you study New York Harbor and you cast your lens upon this region in the era of the railroad, you can very easily argue, as I will today, that Jersey City is not just as important as any borough not just as important as Brooklyn, as Queens, and certainly Staten Island, but perhaps <laughs> more important, Jersey City in the economy of New York Harbor, more important. So how does this come to pass? One of the first things that we need to acknowledge is the mighty width and depth of the Hudson River. You do not have to swim this too many times, Mayor. You do not have to spend time on the ferries to acknowledge the incredible width and depth of this river. And throughout the 19th century, we have neither the technology nor the funding to get across it. We have no tunnels and we have no bridges until finally in 1906 we get our first tunnel. This means if you want to do railroads, you have to terminate your railroad at the Hudson River. And that leads the railroads to Jersey City. This is the fundamental point of my talk. 
To truly start to understand how this plays out in history, I need you to be very clear that this is just an era of history. This is not for all time. Jersey City is very important, but not for all time. In the era of canals, when the mighty Erie Canal is connecting the Hudson River to this, this region, when the Erie Canal goes over to the Great Lakes and connects to the uh, Midwest, Jersey City has no particular importance in economic history because we have our own canal, we have our Morris Canal, but it's certainly not as big and bad as the Erie Canal. So in the era of canals, we're not quite there yet in terms of economic prominence. But then we get in 1838, a inventor by the name of John Stevens. You've probably heard of the Stevens Institute of Technology. And as British inventors and American inventors are experimenting with a great iron horse, the railroad technology, he debuts a railroad in Hoboken, which goes in a circle. It also goes at the frightening speed of five miles per hour. And this is a demonstration of 1838 of something that will absolutely take over. From 1850s to 1900, we are going to be in absolutely the age of the railroads. And this is a key moment in history. You don't have to study the great developments of this era uh, too long to see how much infrastructure goes into the railroads of New York Harbor. Think, for example, of the image you saw of present-day Liberty State Park. When the Central Railroad of New Jersey undertakes its landfill project in 1864, they expand the size of our city. They also expand its role in the economy of New York Harbor. Now, these are the very first railroads to enter New York Harbor. Look closely at the three small red lines. The one in Brooklyn gets you back and forth to Long Island. Well, congratulations, you made it to Long Island. This is hardly a connection to national economic trends. The other railroad coming down the spine of Manhattan is certainly useful to connect to the economy of Yonkers, to get you to Westchester, or even as the railroads develop all the way to Boston. But this does not cross over the barrier, the impassable barrier of the Hudson River. There is only one place when we first begin to do railroads where you can leap over the Hackensack, where you can go to Pennsylvania, where you can harness Ohio steel and Pennsylvania coal, and that is right here in Jersey City. So I would like you to think about this destination, this city, as a massive locus of freight rail. The goods of New York Harbor are flowing in and out of our city. I would also like you to think about this incredible economic contribution in terms of immigration. Very famously, at present-day Liberty State Park, we have the Central Railroad of New Jersey terminal. And this terminal, which you can see clearly depicted here, is connected to Ellis Island. If you come through Ellis Island and you, your destination is anything other than New York City, if it is Ohio, Milwaukee, or Texas, you will go through this immigration depot. You will connect to the mighty railroad through Jersey City. So both in freight rail and in immigration history, we're tops. We're the cat's meow. And I would like to argue that this is in essence the key to our story as we develop the timeline and continue further. Think about Jersey City as a vital connecting point between all of the vast trade of New York Harbor and the rest of the United States. Think of Jersey City in the age of just before the Port Authority, even after the Port Authority, positively blossoming and booming with factories, with warehouses, cold storage, track switching stations, track spurs, railroad terminals, even stockyards. This is our city as a conduit and as a portal for freight and for immigration. And you could even argue that the economy of New York Harbor was built on the backs of our railroad tracks. This economic history is exciting to me, but sadly, it is largely invisible from the historical record. Now, I make two arguments about this invisibility. One, economic history, the things in the timeline, the things I'm speaking about right now, these things are inherently invisible. When you have the opportunity to write about Mayor Frank Haig, 
You're not so interested in coal or beef. When you get the opportunity to think about where our garments come from or where our cotton comes from, it's just not sexy. So economic history, the flows of goods and people in and out of a harbor, doesn't quite have the pop that we get in most of our political history. Another reason that this economic history is largely invisible is the 1921 founding of the Port Authority. The Port Authority of New York Harbor, which was only changed to the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey as late as 1972, people, this institution lifts out all of the incredible economic activity of the Jersey City waterfront, and it, place it, it places it into this amorphous authority, which as we recently learned, may or may not be paying its fair share of taxes. <laughs> so the Port Authority is a key to our story. I have evidence. This is a new line of research for me, and I am digging into the archives. I have been to the Jersey Room of the Free Public Library right here in Jersey City, and these are some of the statistics that have fueled me in my research. Think, for example, of something called the Leiteridge Pier. The Leiteridge Pier, which I have portrayed for you up here, is something that you can use to stick the goods out into the water, to pile them up, and to load them onto skiffs or lighters, and you can float the goods around anywhere you would like in the harbor, from Brooklyn to Manhattan to the railroads, etc. If you count the lighterage piers in the 1921 year when the Port Authority was founded, a full one-third of them were in Jersey City. That's for the entire harbor, the harbor including Weehawken, the harbor including Brooklyn. We've got a third of those bad boys. We've even got more than a third, if you really want to get down to the statistics. What about float bridge terminals? None of you woke up this morning and thought you would be talking about float bridge terminals, but here we are. This is a, either a two-story or a crane-based system for lifting massive quantities of freight onto the skiffs, onto the lighters, onto the floats of the harbor. We've got almost a full one-half of them within the confines of Jersey City. We are statistically dominant in the harbor. We are a major contender. Even when something that we know very much, trucking, takes over, even as railroad is on the wane and auto-based trucking is on the rise, we get the incredible Harborside Terminal, now known as the Harborside Financial Center, a place where people like to rappel down buildings and such. This site was a location for trucking and freight, and Mayor Haig had the vision to go with the tide of history and to connect the trucks to the waterfront at the Harborside Terminal. But never in this great history of freight are we getting the respect we deserve. Nobody is recognizing how much work we are doing. In 1931, when a group of planners write the regional plan for New York and its environs, they specifically cite Jersey City in a supporting role as the industrial role to the great white collar Manhattan. So this is a continued stream of evidence showing us how Jersey City does not have the respect it deserves. There's an image for you of the Harborside Terminal. This is a moment of transition when in the foreground you have a great terminal for shipping that is connected to trucks. And then at the very top of the image, you can see the infrastructure of railroads still growing strong. So Jersey City, even into the 20th century, is majorly contributing to the economy of New York Harbor. Now, as my last specific example to really convince you that this is an important idea, let's talk about stockyards. Here's an image of the famous Chicago Union stockyards. These have been immortalized in song by Frank Sinatra. Anyone who studies Chicago and studies the economy of Chicago would recognize that the stockpiling, so to speak, of cows and pigs, the great stockyards of Chicago, were part of its economy. They were part of the sphere of influence for Chicago. But what about New York City's stockyards? You know of the meatpacking district, certainly, but you might not know about our very own stockyards, which are across the Hudson River right here in Jersey City. Take a look at the little known 19th century McPherson stockyards which were at Exchange Place. I know about these because of my research. 
I also know about these because one of the facilities staff at NJCU where I teach told me that he used to go cow tipping here in a misspent youth. This was massive. This was real. This is our contribution to the meat economy of New York Harbor. But where's the respect? Where's the love for all that we do when we are literally sending cows and pigs to the meatpacking district on floats by the thousands? This is not considered part of New York history. People don't write about it because it's in Jersey City. As a very specific example showing you the importance of this meat to the harbor economy, let us go to February 1946. The tugboat captains of New York Harbor went on strike. The cattle and pigs of the McPherson Yards are stuck there. Not being the best swimmers, the city decided to shut down, I kid you not, the Holland Tunnel to march the cows and pigs through the Holland Tunnel to make sure that the economy of slaughterhouses and meatpacking and New York Harbor continued uninterrupted. That is perhaps my favorite piece of information on just how important this regional economy is to New York Harbor. There is one more piece to the puzzle here, and that is very much something that you, I hope, have heard about. There's a political story in Jersey City that helps to understand the invisibility of economic history. How many of you have heard of infamous mayor Frank Haig? Yes holds on to the mayoralty from 1917 to 1947, and he largely defines for Jersey City the narrative of corruption, whether that's fully deserved or not. He was a friend to the immigrant, but he also made a lot of money. So this narrative sets in motion Jersey City as insular, as isolated, as its own story, when in fact, we are perhaps the greatest sphere of influence for the economy of New York Harbor of them all. So thank you for your time. It's been great to be here.